This is the, trans the, the official transcript of the speech given by the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Gray, in the House of Commons, which is the British Parliament's lower directly elected and by far more, more powerful house on the eve of the official British entry to the First World War. So the date was August the 3rd, 1914. It had been provoked by the German decision to invade two small neutral countries on its western border, Luxembourg and crucially Belgium. So why was this uh, invasion so important? Because in 1839, so 75 years earlier, Britain had undertaken by a treaty to guarantee the neutrality of Belgium. And because Belgium appealing to this treaty naturally and indirectly at least to Britain had refused to allow the German army's divisions uh, that were bound for France to enter and pass through its territory unhindered but had promised to fight against the Germans, then uh, Germany had decided to invade Belgium. And this gave rise to uh, the German Reich Chancellor or Prime Minister Theodor Bettmann Holweg's cynical quote, just for a scrap of paper he was belittling re, uh, referring to that treaty, um, Great Britain shall start a war against a kindred nation that only wishes to live in peace. Uh, with it, or with her, or something similar. So the source is Hansard, which in uh, Britain, and at least in one of its former colonies, Canada, incidentally, uh, the second of the three countries where I've lived after my native land, Finland in Northern Europe, and my current uh, country of residence, the Philippines. So that's the official record of everything, uh, official statement in the parliament. Last week I stated that we were working for peace, not only for this country, but to preserve the peace of Europe. Today events move so rapidly that it is exceedingly difficult to state with technical accuracy the actual state of affairs but it is clear that the peace of Europe cannot be preserved. Russia and Germany, at any rate, have declared war upon each other. Before I proceed to state the position of His Majesty's government, I would like to clear the ground so that before I come to state to the House, what our attitude is with regard to the present crisis. The House may know exactly under what obligations the government is or the House can be said to be in coming to a decision on the matter. First of all, let me say very shortly that we have consistently worked with a single mind, with all the earnestness in our power to preserve peace. The House may be satisfied on that point. We have always done it. During these last years, as far as His Majesty's government are concerned, we would have no difficulty in proving that we have done so. Throughout the Balkan crisis, by general admission, we worked for peace. The cooperation of the great powers of Europe was successful in working for peace in the Balkan crisis. It is true that some of the powers had great difficulty in adjusting their points of view. It took much time and labor and discussion before they could settle their differences, but peace was secured because peace was their main object and they were willing to give time and trouble rather than accentuate differences rapidly. In the present crisis, it has not been possible to secure the peace of Europe because there has been little time and there has been a disposition at any rate in some quarters on which I will not dwell, to force things rapidly to an issue, at any rate, to the great risk of peace. And as we now know, the result of that is the policy of peace 
as far as the great powers generally are concerned, is in danger. I do not want to dwell on that and to comment on it and to say where the blame seems to us to lie, which powers were most in favor of peace, which were most disposed to risk or endanger peace, because I would like the House to approach this crisis in which we are now from the point of view of British interests, British honor and British obligations, free from all passion as to why peace has not been preserved. We shall publish papers as soon as we can <clears throat> regarding what took place last week when we were working for peace. <clears throat> and when those papers are published, I have no doubt that to every human being, they will make it clear how strenuous and genuine and wholehearted our efforts for peace were, and that they will enable people to form their own judgment as to what forces were at work which operated against peace. I come first now to the question of British obligations. I have assured the House, and the Prime Minister has assured the House more than once, that if any crisis such as this arose, we should come before the House of Commons and be able to say to the House that it was free to decide what the British attitude should be, that we would have no secret engagement which we should spring upon the House and tell the House that because we had entered into that engagement, there was an obligation of honor upon the country. I will deal with that point to clear the ground first. There has been in Europe two diplomatic groups. It should rather be there have been in Europe two diplomatic groups, the Triple Alliance and what came to be called the Triple Entente for some years past. The Triple Entente was not an alliance. It was a diplomatic group. The House will remember that in 1908 there was a crisis, also a Balkan crisis originating in the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and my interjection by Austria-Hungary. Uh, these two regions or provinces had belonged to the Ottoman Empire, uh, at, at least nominally until then. The Russian minister, meaning foreign minister, Mr. Izvolsky, came to London, or happened to come to London, because his visit was planned before the crisis broke out. I told him definitely then, this being a Balkan crisis, a Balkan affair, I did not consider that public opinion in this country would justify us in promising to give anything more than diplomatic support. More was never asked from us. More was never given and more was never promised. In this present crisis up till yesterday, we all have also given no promise of anything more than diplomatic support. Up till yesterday, no promise of more than diplomatic support. Now, I must make this question of obligation clear to the House. I must go back to the first Moroccan crisis of 1906. That was the time of the al Siras conference, and it came at a time of very great difficulty to His Majesty's government when a general election was in progress, and ministers were scattered over the country, and I, spending three days a week in my constituency and three days at the foreign office, was asked the question of whether, if that crisis developed into war between France and Germany, we would give armed support. I said then that I could promise nothing to any foreign power unless it was subsequently to receive the wholehearted support of public opinion here, if the occasion arose. I said, in my opinion, if war was forced upon France, then on the question of Morocco, a question which had just been the subject of agreement between this country and France, an agreement exceedingly popular on both sides, that if out of that agreement war was forced on France at that time, in my view, public opinion in this country would have rallied to the material support of France. I gave no promise but I expressed that opinion during the crisis, as far as I remember, almost in the same words to the French ambassador and the German ambassador at the time. I made no promise 
and I used no threats, but I expressed that opinion. That position was accepted by the French government, but they said to me at the time, and I think very reasonably, if you think it possible that the public opinion of Great Britain might, should a sudden crisis arise, justify you in giving to France the armed support which you cannot promise in advance. You will not be able to give that support even if you wish to give it when the time comes, unless some conversations have already taken place between naval and military experts. There was force in that. I agreed to it and authorized those conversations to take place, but on the distinct understanding that nothing which passed between military or naval experts should bind either government or restrict in any way their freedom to make a decision as to whether or not they would give that support when the time arose. As I have told the House, upon that occasion a general election was in prospect. I had to take the responsibility of doing that without the cabinet. It could not be summoned. An answer had to be given. I consulted Sir Henry Campbellman, Campbell Bannerman, the Prime Minister. I consulted, I remember, Lord Haldane, who was then Secretary of State for War, and the present Prime Minister, by the way, Herbert Asquith, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer. That was the most I could do, and they authorized that on the distinct understanding that it left the hands of the government free whenever the crisis arose. The fact that conversations between military and naval experts took place was later on, I think much later on, because that crisis passed and the thing ceased to be of importance. But later on, it was brought to the knowledge of the cabinet. The Agadir crisis came, another Morocco crisis. And throughout that, I took precisely the same line that had been taken in 1906. But subsequently, in 1912, after discussion and consideration in the cabinet, it was decided that we ought to have the, a definite understanding in writing, which was to be only in the form of an unofficial letter, that these conversations which took place were not binding upon the freedom of either government. And on the 22nd of November, 1912, I wrote to the French ambassador the letter, which I will now read to the house and I received from him a letter in similar terms in reply. The letter which I have to read to the House is this, and it will be known to the public now as the record that whatever took place between military and naval experts, they were not binding engagements upon the government. My dear Ambassador, from time to time in recent years, the French and British naval and military experts have consulted together. It has always been understood that such consultation does not restrict the freedom of either government to decide at any future time whether or not to assist the other by armed force. We have agreed that consultation between experts is not and ought not to be regarded as an engagement that commits either government to action in a contingency that has not yet arisen and may never arise. The disposition, for instance, of the French and British fleets, respectively, at the present moment is not based upon an engagement to cooperate in war. You have, however, pointed out that if either government had grave reason to expect an unprovoked attack by a third power, it might become essential to know whether it could in that event depend upon the armed assistance of the other. I agree that if either government had grave reason to expect an unprovoked attack by a third power or something that threatened the general peace, it should immediately discuss the, uh, with the other whether both governments should act together to prevent aggression and to preserve peace, and if so, what measures they would be prepared to take in common. Lord Charles Beersford interjected, what is the date of that? And Sir Edward Gray, the Foreign Secretary, answered, the 22nd November 1912. That is the starting point for the government with regard to the present crisis. I think it makes it clear that what the Prime Minister and I said to the House of Commons was perfectly justified and that as regards our freedom 
to decide in a crisis what our line should be, whether we should intervene or whether we should abstain, the government remained perfectly free and a fortiori, the House of Commons remains perfectly free. That I say to clear the ground from the point of view of obligation. I think it was due to prove our good faith to the House of Commons that I should give that full information to the House now. And I say what I think is obvious from the letter I've just read, that we do not construe anything which has previously taken place in our diplomatic relations with other powers in this matter as restricting the freedom of the government to decide what attitude they should take now or restrict the freedom of the House of Commons to decide what their attitude should be. Well, sir, I will go further and I will say this. The situation in the present crisis is not precisely the same as it was in the Morocco question. In the Morocco question, it was primarily a dispute which concerned France, a dispute which concerned France and France primarily, a dispute, as it seemed to us, affecting France out of an agreement subsisting between us and France and published to the whole world, in which we engaged to give France diplomatic support. No doubt we were pledged to give nothing but diplomatic support. We were at any rate pledged by a definite public agreement to stand with France diplomatically in that question. The present crisis has originated differently. It has not originated with regard to Morocco. It has not originated as regards anything with which we had a special agreement with France. It has not originated with anything which primarily concerned France. It has originated in a dispute between Austria and Serbia, meaning Serbia. I can say this with the most absolute confidence. No government and no country has less desire to be involved in war over a dispute with Austria and Serbia than the government and the country of France. They are involved in it because of their obligation of honor under a definite alliance with Russia. Well, it is only fair to say to the House that the obligation of honor cannot apply to, in the same way to us. We are not parties to the Franco-Russian alliance. We do not even know the terms of that alliance. So far, I have, I think, faithfully and completely cleared the ground with regard to the question of obligation. I now come to what we think the situation requires. For many years, we have had a long-standing friendship with France, an honorable member, and with Germany. I remember well the feeling in the House and my own feeling, for I spoke on the subject. I think when the late government made the agreement with France, the warm and cordial feeling resulting from the fact that these two nations, who had a perpetual differences in the past, had cleared these differences away. I remember saying, I think, that it seemed to me that some benign influence had been at work to produce the cordial atmosphere that had made that possible. But how far that friendship entails obligation. It has been a friendship between the nations and ratified by the nations. How far that entails an obligation. Let every man look into his own heart and his own feelings and construe the extent to, of the obligation for himself. I, I construe it myself as I feel it. But I do not wish to urge upon anyone else more than their feelings dictate as to what they should feel about the obligation. The House, individually and collectively, may, may judge for itself. I speak my personal view, and I have given the House my own feeling in the matter. The French fleet is not the French fleet being concentrated in the Mediterranean. The situation is very different from what it used to be, because the friendship which has grown up between the two countries has given them a sense of security that there was nothing to be feared from us. The French coasts are absolutely undefended. The French fleet is in the Mediterranean and has for some years been concentrated there because of the feeling of confidence and friendship which has existed between the two countries. My own feeling is that if a foreign fleet engaged in a war which France had not sought and in which she had not been the aggressor, came down the English Channel and bombarded and battered the undefended coasts of France, we could not stand aside and see this going on practically within sight of our own, of our eyes, with our arms folded, looking on dispassionately, doing nothing. I believe that would be the feeling of this country. 
There are times when one feels that if this, these circumstances actually did arise, it would be a feeling which would spread with irresistible force throughout the land. But I also want to look at the matter without sentiment and from that and from the uh, point of view of British interests and it is on that that I'm going to base and justify what I'm presently going to say to the House. If we say nothing at this moment, what is France to do with her fleet in the Mediterranean if she leaves it there? With no statement from us as to what we will do, she leaves her northern and western coasts absolutely undefended, at the mercy of a German fleet coming down the channel to do as it pleases in a war which is a war of life and death between them. If we say nothing, it may be that the French fleet is withdrawn from the Mediterranean. We are in the presence of a European conflagration. Can anyone set limits to the consequences that may arise out of it? Let us assume that today we stand aside in an attitude of neutrality, saying, no, we cannot undertake and engage to help either party in this conflict. Let us suppose the French fleet is withdrawn from the Mediterranean. And let us assume that uh, the consequences, which are already tremendous in what has happened in Europe, even to countries which are at peace, in fact, equally whether countries are at peace or at war. Let us assume that out of that come consequences unforeseen, which make it necessary at a sudden moment that, in defense of vital British interests, we should go to war and just assume, which is quite possible, that Italy, who is now neutral, honorable members, hear, hear, because, as I understand, she considers that this war is an aggressive war, and the Triple Alliance being a defensive alliance, her obligation did not arise. Let us assume that consequences which are not yet foreseen and which perfectly legitimately consulting her own interests make Italy depart from her attitude of neutrality at a time <clears throat> when we are forced in defense of vital British interests ourselves to fight. What then will be the position in the Mediterranean? <clears throat> it might be that at some critical moment, those consequences would be forced upon us because our trade routes in the Mediterranean might be vital to this country. Nobody can say that in the course of the next few weeks, there's any particular trade route or, or route, the keeping open of which may not be vital to this country. What will be our position then? We have not kept a fleet in the Mediterranean, which is equal to dealing alone with a combination of other fleets in the Mediterranean. It would be the very moment when we could not detach more ships to the Mediterranean. And we might have exposed this country from our negative attitude at the present moment to the most appalling risk. I say that from the viewpoint, the point of view of British interests. We feel strongly that France was entitled to know and to know at once whether or not in the event of attack upon her unprotected northern and western coasts, she could depend upon British support. In that emergency and in these compelling circumstances, yesterday afternoon I gave to the French ambassador the following statement. I'm authorized to give an assurance that if the German fleet comes into the channel or through the North Sea to undertake hostile operations against the French coasts or shipping, the British fleet will give all the protection in its power. This assurance is, of course, subject to the policy of His Majesty's government, receiving the support of Parliament, and must not be taken as binding His Majesty's government to take any action until the above contingency of action by the German fleet takes place. I read that to the House, not as a declaration of war on our part, not as entailing immediate aggressive action on our part, but as binding us to take aggressive action should that contingency arise. Things move very hurriedly from hour to hour. Fresh news comes in, and I cannot give this in any very formal way, but I understand that the German government would be prepared if we would pledge ourselves to neutrality to agree that its fleet would cut, attack, would not attack the northern coast of France. I have only heard that shortly before I came to the house, 
but it is far too narrow an engagement for us. And so there is the more serious consideration becoming more serious every hour. There is the question of the neutrality of Belgium. I shall have to put before the House at some length what is our position in regard to Belgium. The governing factor is the Treaty of 1839, but this is a treaty with a history, a history accumulated since. In 1870, when there was war between France and Germany, I should add rather the German Confederation led by Prussia, and then as a result of the uh, French defeat in that war, uh, the German Second German Empire was proclaimed humiliatingly and even irritatingly for France, if not infuriatingly, in the Hall of Mirrors or La, Glace, La Salle des Glaces uh, of the Versailles Palace near, uh, in near Paris in uh, January 1871. The question of the neutrality of Belgium, aro Belgium arose and various things were said. Amongst other things, Prince Bismarck gave an assurance to Belgium that confirming his verbal assurance, he gave in writing a declaration which he said was superfluous in reference to the treaty in existence, that the German Confederation and its allies would respect the neutrality of Belgium. It being always understood that the, that neutrality would be respected by the other belligerent powers. That is valuable as a recognition in 1870 on the part of Germany of the sacredness of these treaty rights. What was our own attitude? The people who laid down the attitude of the British government were Lord Granville in the House of Lords and Mr. Gladstone in the House of Commons. Lord Granville on the 8th of August, 1870 used these words. He said, we might have explained to the country and to foreign nations that we did not think this country was bound either morally or internationally or that its interests were concerned in the maintenance of the neutrality of Belgium. Though this course might have had some conveniences, though it might have been easy to adhere to it, though it might have saved us from some immediate danger, it is a course which Her Majesty's government thought it impossible to adopt in the name of the country with any due regard to the country's honor or to the country's interests. Mr. Gladstone, spoke as follows two days later. There is, I admit, the obligation of the treaty. It is not necessary, nor would time permit me to enter into the complicated question of the nature of the obligations of that treaty. But I'm not able to subscribe to the doctrine of those who have held this in this house, what plainly amounts to an assertion that the simple fact of the existence of a guarantee is binding on every party to it, irrespectively altogether of the particular position in which it may find itself at the time when the occasion for acting on the guarantee arises. The great authorities upon foreign policy to whom I have been accustomed to listen, such as Lord Aberdeen and Lord Palmerston, never to my knowledge took that rigid and, if I may venture to say so, that impracticable view of the guarantee. The circumstance that there is already an existing guarantee in force is of necessity an important fact and a weighty element in the case to which we are bound to give full and ample consideration. There is also this further consideration, the force of which we must all feel most deeply, and that is the common interests against the unmeasured aggrandizement of any power whatever. The treaty is an old treaty, 1839, and that was the view taken of it in 1870. It is one of those treaties which are founded not only on consideration for Belgium, which benefits under the treaty, but in the interests of those who guarantee the neutrality of Belgium. The honor and interests are at least as strong today as in 1870, and we cannot take a more narrow view or less serious view of our obligations and of the importance of those obligations that was taken by Mr. Gladstone's government in 1870. I will read to the House what took place last week on this subject. When mobilization was beginning, I knew that this question must be a most important element in our policy, a most important subject for the House of Commons. I telegraphed at the same time in similar terms to both Paris and Berlin to say 
that it was essential for us to know whether the French and German governments respectively were prepared to undertake an engagement to respect the neutrality of Belgium. These are the replies. I got from the French government this reply. The French government are resolved to respect the neutrality of Belgium and it would only be in the event of some other power violating that neutrality that France might find itself, herself, <clears throat> under the necessity in order to assure the defense of her security to act otherwise. This assurance has been given several times. The President of the Republic spoke of it to the King of the Belgians and the French Minister at Brussels has spontaneously renewed the assurance to the Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs today. From the German government, the reply was, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs could not possibly give an answer before consulting the Emperor and the Imperial Chancellor. Sir Edward Goshen, to whom I had said it was important to have an answer soon, said he hoped the answer would not be too long delayed. The German Minister for Foreign Affairs gave, then gave Sir Edward Goshen to understand that he rather doubted whether they could answer at all, as any reply they might give could not fail in the event of war to have the undesirable effect of disclosing, to a certain extent, part of then plan of campaign. I telegraphed at the same time to Brussels to the Belgian government, and I got the following reply from Sir Francis Villers. The Minister for Foreign Affairs thanks me for the communication and replies that Belgium will, to the utmost of her power, maintain neutrality and expects and desires other powers to observe and uphold it. He begged me to add that the relations between Belgium and the neighboring powers were excellent and there was no reason to suspect their intentions, but that the Belgian government believed in the case of violation, they were in a position to defend the neutrality of their country. It now appears from the news I have received today, which has come quite recently, and I am not yet quite sure how far it has reached me in an accurate form, that an ultimatum has been given to Belgium by Germany, the object of which was to offer Belgium friendly relations with Germany on condition she would facilitate the passage of German troops through Belgium. Well, sir, until one has these things absolutely definitely up to the last moment, I do not wish to say all that one would say uh, if one were in a position to give the House full, complete and absolute information upon the point. We were sounded in the course of last week as to whether if a guarantee were given that after the war Belgium, uh, Belgian integrity would be preserved, that would content us. We replied that we could not bargain away whatever interests or obligations we had in Belgian neutrality. Shortly before I reached the house, I was informed <clears throat> that the following telegram had been received from the King of the Belgians by our King, King George, by the way, King George the Fifth. Remembering the numerous proofs of Your Majesty's friendship and that of your predecessors and the friendly attitude of England in 1870 and the proof of friendship she had, has just given us again, I make a supreme appeal to the diplomatic intervention of Your Majesty's government to safeguard the integrity of Belgium. Diplomatic intervention took place last week on our part. What can a diplomatic intervention do now? We have great and vital interests in the independence and integrity is the least part of Belgium. If Belgium is compelled to submit to allow her neutrality to be violated, of course the situation is clear. Even if by agreement she admitted the violation of her neutrality, it is clear she could only do sounder duress. The smaller states in that region of Europe ask but one thing. Their one desire is that they should be left alone and independent. The one thing they fear is, I think, not so much that their integrity, but that their independence should be interfered with. If in this war, which is before Europe, the neutrality of one of those countries is violated, if the troops of one of the combatants violate its neutrality and no action be taken to resent it um, at the end of the war, whatever the integrity may be, the independence will be gone. 
I have one further quotation from Mr. Gladstone as to what he thought about the independence of Belgium. It will be found in Hansard, volume 203, page 1787. I have not had time to read the whole speech and verify the context, but the thing seems to me so clear that no context could make any difference to the meaning of it. Mr. Gladstone said, we have an interest in the independence of Belgium, which is wider than that which we may have in the literal operation of the guarantee. It is found in the answer to the question whether under the circumstances of the case, this country endowed us as it is with influence and power would quietly stand by and witness the perpetration of the direst crime that ever stained the pages of history and thus become participators in the same. No, sir. If it be the case that there has been anything in the nature of an ultimatum to Belgium, asking her to compromise or violate her neutrality, whatever may be, may have been offered to her in return, her independence <clears throat> is gone if that holds. Um, if her independence goes, the independence of Holland will follow. Holland, of course, is the informal name for the Netherlands. I ask the House from the point of view of British interests to consider what may be at stake. If France is beaten in a struggle of life and death, beaten to her knees, loses her position as a great power becomes subordinate to the will and power of one greater than herself, consequences which I do not anticipate because I'm sure that France has the power to defend herself with all the energy and ability and patriotism which she has shown so often. Still, if that were to happen and if Belgium, Belgium fell under the same dominating influence and then Holland and then Denmark then would not Mr. Gladstone's words come true, that just opposite to us there would be a common interest against the unmeasured aggrandizement of any power. It may be said, I suppose that we might stand aside, husband our strength, and that whatever happened in the course of this war, at the end of it intervened with effect to put things right and to adjust them to our own, own point of view. If in a crisis like this, we run away from those obligations of honor and interest as regards the Belgian treaty. I doubt whether whatever material force we might have at the end, it would be of very much value in the face of the respect that we should have lost. And I do not believe whether a great power stands outside this war or not. It is going to be in a position at the end of it to exert its superior strength for us with a powerful fleet which we believe able to protect our commerce, to protect our shores, and to protect our interests. If we are engaged in war, we shall suffer but little more than we shall suffer even if we stand aside. If we are going to suffer, I'm afraid, terribly in this war, whether we are in it or whether we stand aside, foreign trade is going to stop. Not because the trade routes are closed, but because there is no trade at the other end. Continental nations engaged in war, all their populations, all their energies, all their wealth engaged in a desperate struggle, they cannot carry on the trade with us that they are carrying on in times of peace, whether we are parties to the war or whether we are not. I do not believe for a moment that at the end of this war, even if we stood aside and remained aside, we should be in a position, a material position, to use our force decisively to undo what had happened in the course of the war, to prevent the whole of the West of Europe opposite to us, if that had been the result of the war, falling under the domination of a single power. And I'm quite sure that our moral position would be such as to have lost us all respect. I can only say that I have put the question of Belgium somewhat hypothetically, because I am not yet sure of all the facts but if the facts turn out to be as they have reached us at present, it is quite clear that there is an obligation on this country to do its utmost to prevent the consequences to which those facts will lead if they are undisputed. I have read to the House the only engagements that we have yet <laughs> taken 
definitely with regard to the use of force. I think it is due to the House to say that we have taken no engagement yet with regard to sending an expeditionary armed force out of the country. Mobilization of the fleet has taken place. Mobilization of the army has taken place, but we have as yet taken no engagement because I do feel that in the case of a European conflagration such as this, unprecedented with our enormous responsibilities in India and other parts of the empire or in countries in British occupation, with all the unknown factors, we must take very carefully into consideration the use which we make of sending an expeditionary force out of the country until we know how we stand. One thing I would say, the one bright spot in the whole of this terrible situation is Ireland. The general feeling throughout Ireland, and I would like this to be clearly understood abroad, does not make the Irish question a consideration which we feel we have now to take into account. I have told the House now how far we have at present gone in commitments and the conditions which influence our policy, and I have put to the House and dwelt at length upon how vital is the condition of the neutrality of Belgium. Belgium. What other policy is there before the House? There is but one way in which the government could make certain <clears throat> at the present moment of keeping outside this war, and that would be that it should immediately issue a proclamation of unconditional neutrality. We cannot do that. We have made the commitment to France that I have read to the House which prevents us from doing that. We have got the consideration of Belgium which prevents us also from any unconditional neutrality and without those conditions absolutely satisfied and satisfactory, we are bound not to shrink from proceeding to the use of all the forces in our power. If we did take that line by saying we will have nothing whatever to do with this matter under no conditions, the Belgian treaty obligations, the possible position in the Mediterranean with damage to British interests and what may happen to France from our failure to support France. If we were to say that all those things mattered nothing, whereas nothing, and to say we would stand aside, we should, I believe, sacrifice our respect and good name and reputation before the world and should not escape <clears throat> the most serious and grave economic consequences. My object has been to explain the view of the government and to place before the House the issue and the choice. I do not for a moment conceal after what I have said and after the information, incomplete as it is, that I have given to the House with regard to Belgium, that we must be prepared and we are prepared for the consequences of having to use all the strength we have at any moment, we know not how soon, to defend ourselves and to take our part. We know. If the facts all be as I have stated them, though I have announced no intending aggressive action on our part, no final decision to resort to force at a moment's notice until we know the whole of the case that the use of it may be forced upon us. As far as the forces of the Crown are concerned, we are ready. I believe the Prime Minister and my right honourable friend, the First Lord of the Admiralty, have no doubt whatever that that the readiness and the efficiency of those forces we were never at a higher mark than they are today. And never was there a time when confidence was more justified in the power of the Navy to protect our commerce and to protect our shores. The thought is with us always of the suffering and misery entailed from which no country in Europe will escape and from which no abdication or neutrality will save us. The amount of harm that can be done by an enemy ship to our trade is infinitesimal compared with the amount of harm that must be done by the economic condition that is caused on the continent. The most awful responsibility is resting upon the government in deciding what to advise the House of Commons to do. We have disclosed our mind to the House of Commons. We have disclosed the issue, the information which we have and made clear to the House. I trust that we are prepared to face that situation and that should it develop as probably it may develop, we will face it. We worked for peace up to the last moment and beyond the last moment. How hard, 
how persistently and how earnestly we strove for peace last week, the House will see from the papers that will be before it. But that is over and as far as the peace of Europe is concerned. We are now face to face with the situation and all the consequences which it may yet, which may yet have to unfold. We believe we shall have the support of the House at large in proceeding to whatever the consequences may be and whatever measures may be forced upon us by the development of facts or action taken by others. I believe the country so quickly has the situation been forced upon it has not had time to realize the issue. It perhaps is still thinking of the quarrel between Austria and Serbia and not the complications of this matter which have grown out of the quarrel between Austria and Serbia. Russia and Germany we know are at war. We do not yet know officially that Austria, the ally whom Germany is to support, is yet at war with Russia. We know that a good deal has been happening on the French frontier. We do not know that the German ambassador has left Paris. The situation has developed so rapidly that technically, as regards the condition of the war, it is most difficult to describe what has actually happened. I wanted to bring out the underlying issues which would affect our own conduct and our own policy and to put them clearly. I have put the vital facts before the House and if, as seems not improbable, we are forced and rapidly forced to take our stand upon those issues, then I believe when the country realizes what is at stake, what the real issues are, the magnitude of the impending dangers in the West of Europe, which I have endeavored to describe to the House, we shall be supported throughout, not only by the House of Commons, but by the determination, the resolution, the courage, and the endurance of the whole country.